can you talk about McRaven and Gordes? One of the characters in our, in our film is Admiral William McRaven, who um, is, I, I think, one of the most powerful uh, military figures in modern US history. Um, McRaven is the current uh, commander of SOCOM, the Special Operations Command, the, in charge of all special operations activity across the globe in more than 100 countries. Uh, but McRaven was actually an original member of SEAL Team 6, uh, the Naval Warfare Sp uh, Development Group, DevGrew it's called now. He was an original member of SEAL Team 6 and spent much of his career in the shadows of, uh, of covert and clandestine US military operations. And he would have been forward deployed to Afghanistan uh, shortly after 9-11, but he had uh, uh, injured his back in a parachuting accident um, at a training uh, exercise in California where, there was a, where his SEAL team was uh, based at the time. And so instead of forward deploying to Afghanistan, Admiral McRaven was tapped by General Wayne Downing, who was coming up with the, uh, with the process for putting people on these kill lists um, after 9-11 and trying to take down all of the leadership of Al-Qaeda or anyone that they could attach to uh, the 9-11 attacks. And, and Downing asked uh, Admiral McRaven to come and advise the National Security Council. People think of the National Security Council as this huge body. It's, it's the president, the vice president, the secretary of defense, the secretary of state, and then staffers. But it really is just the core officials who dictate this policy. So if the, if the NSC is making decisions about targeted killing, it's really the, the principles uh, uh, that, are, that are doing with national defense, national security, counterterrorism. So McRaven became the advisor to the most powerful officials in the US government in developing how to implement the hunting down and killing of Osama bin Laden and, and, and others. And in the, at the beginning, there were, by some estimates, between seven and two dozen individuals that were put on this list for, uh, in, in the beginning it was kill or capture, but the emphasis was often on, on kill. And McRaven saw firsthand how the White House worked, and he learned uh, a great deal about the politics of an administration because he was there helping to craft a policy that he would later then run when he became the head of all special operations forces. So McRaven is there for a couple of years and then ends up going to Iraq where he was the deputy commander of the Joint Special Operations Command under uh, Stanley McChrystal who was very close to Dick Cheney. Cheney had gotten him a fellowship at the Council on Foreign Relations um, and McChrystal was the commander of JSOC for much of the Bush administration. McRaven is working under McChrystal, running the kill campaign in Iraq and, uh, and coordinating all of these you know, actions against uh, both the, what was called Al-Qaeda in Mesopotamia or Al-Qaeda in Iraq, um, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, um, and also going after Muqtada al-Sadr's forces and others. So he, he sort of understood both ends of the, the game, how it was run in the White House and then how it was implemented in the field. And when President Obama came into office, uh, the, the, the two people who were responsible for the most covert, sensitive operations being run by primarily Cheney and Rumsfeld outside of the chain of command were General McChrystal and Admiral McRaven, and they became the two most influential figures in shaping the Obama administration's counterterrorism policy. And so uh, President Obama really empowered those forces and actually had McRaven in the White House helping to shape the policy, not just implement the military actions, but actually shaping policy. And most people had never heard of Admiral McRaven, and of course he's now a kind of iconic figure because he commanded the raid that killed Osama bin Laden. And of course Disney tried to trademark SEAL Team 6 after the bin, the bin Laden raid. It's a true story. Um, and, and, but but what I, the way that I discovered the identity of, of, of uh, Admiral McRaven was um, in February of 2010, there was a raid in um, Gardez in Afghanistan in Paktia province. And a, a US special operations team had intelligence that there was a Taliban compound and that people living in a particular compound in this area were members of the Taliban and were plotting attacks against American forces. And they raid this compound in the middle of the night. And they end up killing uh, a number of men and two pregnant women. Um, and it turned out that this was not a Taliban family. In fact, they weren't even ethnic Pashtun. They were, they were uh, uh, from a minority ethnic group in the province. And they, the man of the house was a senior Afghan police commander who had been trained by the US forces 
and, and his family showed me his documents. He had actually been trained by a private security company called MPRI, uh, which is made up of very uh, of high-ranking former military officials, intelligence officials, and others. And so these women were killed. This Afghan police commander who had fought with US soldiers against the Taliban and against the Haqqani network in his province, and, and whose house was filled with pictures of him and US soldiers, uh, smiling in these pictures had had just been killed, and when the when the commandos that ra the U.S. commandos had, that raided the house realized that they had killed these women, and that the men that they had killed were not in fact Taliban, and that what they were doing that night was the most anti-Taliban of things they could have been doing, which was to be having a party with live music, celebrating the naming of a child, and men were dancing and playing instruments, and it was this loud, boisterous party and we have their cell phone video from that night. So they, they, they raid this house, these people are killed. Instead of saying, wow, we, we really messed up and owning it. And that stuff happens every day in Afghanistan. People are getting killed all the time that have no attachment whatsoever to the Taliban or Al Qaeda or the Haqqani network. And the US will often just pay them a little bit of money and, and move on and it never makes it into the papers. Th that wouldn't have been out of place. But instead of doing that, they dug the bullets out of the women's bodies and then they told their commanders that what had happened in the compound that night uh, was, a, was a Taliban ambush uh, of this family and that they had come upon these women who had been killed by the Taliban. And then they, they were leaks saying that, well, no, this is actually an honor killing and the women were killed by their own family members. And, 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 and they put out a press release and, and spokespeople made these statements saying that this, that the US soldiers were essentially heroes that had gone in there and saved everyone else. But then the, the, the family members, because they were a prominent family, one of the, the fathers of the women was the uh, vice dean at Gardez University who spoke fluent English, started calling reporters and telling people, you know, this is not what, what, the, what NATO is saying. Then a very great reporter named Jerome Starkey actually went down there, he writes for the Times of London, and interviewed the family members and did a story saying, that this was a NATO raid, he didn't know it was JSOC at the time, that, the, that this was a botched NATO raid and that NATO had tried to cover it up. And he told the story of these families. And when Jerome Starkey did this, NATO did something extraordinary. They named him in a press release and said, Jerome Starkey of the Times of London is lying. They actually accused him of lying. And I mean, that, that could have ended Starkey's career. And Starkey, to his credit, kept pushing and pushing and ended up doing a number of stories and got close to that family. And Rick and I also went to this family and filmed with them. Um, and you'll you see this in our video and tell this story and tell the story of what happened to Jerome Starkey as well. So, so uh, media attention is, is, is focused in now on this village and this one family's compound. And eventually uh, NATO calls up Starkey and they said, we're about to put out a press release. We're gonna change our version of events. And they admit, that their forces had killed, that NATO forces had killed these pregnant women and that the men were not Taliban commanders. Um, so the family told me and told Jerome Starkey the same thing, which is that they got a call and, and, and a person they believed was General Stanley McChrystal was going to be coming to visit them. And at the time, McChrystal was the commander of all US and NATO forces in Afghanistan. So they thought that General McChrystal was coming to see them. They called Jerome Starkey. Starkey goes down there with his photographer, Jeremy Kelly, and they're waiting with the family, thinking that McChrystal's gonna show up. And up pull, pulls this convoy of vehicles with countless uh, Afghan uh, military officials and some Americans interspersed with them. And they, in the center of this crowd is a guy with uh, a name tag that says McRaven on it and, and has three stars um, on the lapel. And, um, and they brought with them two sheep and, and, and they approached the compound in the very place where the women had been killed and, and this command, police commander had been killed. And they offload these sheep and they put a knife up to the sheep, sheep's neck and they were going to sacrifice the sheep. And that what they were doing was a, was a ritual from these people's culture, the people who, who were the victims of this. And they were it was like a forgiveness ritual. So they're coming. Admiral McRaven shows up with some sheep after this family had been gunned down. And, then they, and they had blamed it on the family and then said it was Taliban. And that, so that, this scene is unfolding. This photographer, Jeremy Kelly, starts taking pictures of, he didn't know who he was at the time, of Admiral McRaven. And at the time, Admiral McRaven was the commander of the most elite, secretive U US military force. And, and he shows up with a sheep in Gard Gardez, Afghanistan, and they're offering to sacrifice it. And the American and Afghan forces try to stop the photographer. They try to hit the camera away. 
They say that Starkey and, 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 and Jeremy Kelly are not allowed in, but the family, and it was so smart of them, the family said, no, we, we want him here as a witness so that someone independent is here to know what, you, what goes on today. And so they have photos, and Starkey took in shorthand all the notes of what McRaven said in the room that day, and McRaven admitted to the, the head of this household that it was his forces that had killed these pregnant women and, it, and, and, and the Afghan police commander, and he apologized. And then there were all these stories that went out on ABC News and others that the head of the household had, had accepted the apology. When I spoke to him, he said, I don't expe expect, accept their apology at all. He said, the special forces did cruel things to us. They beat us, they ruined our life, they wiped out our economy in our, in our compound by taking away all of these people and they killed our pregnant women. I wouldn't trade my two sons for the entire kingdom of the United States, is what he said. And another man chimed in and he said, these are these commandos with beards, we call them the American Taliban. And, and this is an anti-Taliban family. And, uh, and, and, and so, you know, when I watched the Bin Laden raid coverage, and people started saying JSOC publicly, and we were showed, you know, that the dog was named Cairo and was a Belinois, French, Belgian Melanois or whatever, and then they, we know what guns were used, and you know, Rick and I talk about this all the time. We know every detail that was leaked, and of course a lot of it turned out to be not true, uh, but that's for a different story. I was thinking, where was the coverage of, like, wall-to-wall -wall coverage of this operation that they did? Because that would give us a little bit more of a balanced picture of what happens in the thousands of night raids that happen every year in Afghanistan or in Pakistan or in countries that we're not even aware we're raiding right now. And, and so that, that story for me really resonated strongly because um, I think we only have a tiny fraction of understanding the extent of the kinds of operations that are being done on a daily basis around the world. And we often hear about them when they go the way that those in power want or when the version that they want publicized is the one accepted by powerful media outlets.